first speaker who's I think going to show us a documentary, um, Uju. She is a Nigerian woman living and working in the UK as a biomedical scientist. She is not only an international acclaimed pro-life speaker and strategist, but also the founder of the Culture of Life in Africa, an organisation dedicated to defending the sanctity and dignity of human life through research, information and education. Today, Uju will be introducing her new documentary, Strings Attached. Um, we're very, very lucky to have her, so we'll just give a round of applause. Thank you. at dinner this evening when John told me, oh, I didn't know Eden was related to you. <laughs> and I thought, Eden related to me. Yeah, she said she's related to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it happened to me that she was joking and he actually took her serious. <laughs> so I said, okay, she's half black, so maybe she's half Nigerian in that way. Yeah, she's related to me. <laughs> So Eden, my cousin, <laughs> thanks for the introduction. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, if you feel that I'm a little bit slow or, you know, my words are being slurred, pardon me because I just came back from America. <laughs> we were at the United Nations, as some of you may know, this is the season at the UN for the uh, so-called Commission on the Status of Women. So anyone who is on Facebook and you see some of my posts on Facebook, I was at the UN attending a radical, radical abortion meeting on Wednesday morning where I crashed their meeting and they, nobody actually knew I was pro-life and this was a meeting on abortion rights. And I just sat there and I was the only black girl there and uh, they just kept giving me so much love. <laughs> you know, all the materials they had, even the ones that they were shot on, they were just giving me everything. And I kept thinking, gosh, if only they knew. So, but uh, we came from that to this. So this is quite an upliftment for me because it's always very difficult. I mean, I make light of it and I, always, you know, I say it as a joke now, but to tell you honestly, if you're sitting in a room with 100 people who are foaming at the mouth, so to say, for abortion rights and they are speaking about abortion rights is like as if it's the most important right in the world and they are talking about it as if it should be a universal human right. I tell you that in so many ways it does uh, drag you down. So thank you for having me here because I've just come back to energize and get you know refreshed and this is the refreshment for me. So thanks for having me. <coughs> now this evening, this wouldn't be of course an actual presentation per se. This is really uh, me presenting to you a documentary that I made over a period of two years. In fact, it wasn't just me, it was a, a group of people and this documentary came about almost by accident, quite unexpectedly. Um, I had been doing pro-life work and you will see a little bit of that at the very beginning of the documentary, how uh, an ordinary Nigerian girl living in the UK would really stumble into the pro-life movement because it was what I did, I stumbled into the pro-life movement because uh, of some, <clears throat> something that happened um, back in 2012. So, but, uh, so following that, I started doing some pro-life work, but not really pro-life work as many of you would be used to with Spock. Um, I was going from here, uh, you know, from England back to, the uh, back to Africa and different African countries. In fact, not just my country, Nigeria, but several other African countries trying to um, <clears throat> help to... to strengthen pro-life movements. Most Africans are actually pro-life. I mean, overwhelmingly, uh, we have the numbers, but the problem we have, uh, if any of you know anything about, you know, the pro-life movement in Africa is that it's not really formed. It's not, you know, so there is not a lot of organizations out there uh, as you have in most of the Western countries. And that is really understandable because in most of the African countries anyway, we don't have legal abortion. So in many places, people are pro-life, but then they are not yet organized in a form that, you know, that you see it here. So I was going back um, from year to year trying to help uh, organize or propose or help support people who wanted uh, things like pro-life marches, pro-life conferences. We worked a lot with African bishops. Uh, here, Norman is from EWT, and dear Norman, my brother Norman is from South Africa. Uh, I and Norman have been together in many places in South Africa, in Nigeria, in Uganda. So we have fought the battle together in, in many, many places uh, uh, back home. 
So we, I, we were going out there, speaking to people, doing conferences, you know, doing whatever we could to serve, really, the pro-life movement out there. When, <clears throat> at different points in different countries, I kept hearing one thing coming up over and over again. Now, most of the African countries, as I say to you, uh, don't actually have legal abortion. Most of them have refused to legalize abortion. People are against it. But it doesn't mean that abortion is not being performed. It doesn't mean that there, there are no illegal abortion practices out there. There are illegal abortion practices. And if anyone wonders why, well, there is a lot of poverty you know, across the different countries in Africa. Uh, but in the same way, there are a lot of illegal things going on. It's not only abortion, there are a lot of illegal practices going on in so many places, in so many corners of society, uh, as people really try to survive when things are, are so hard. So, which is very, very unfortunate, and there's still a lot of work to be done that, so that women can be met at the point of their need. Um, but also, these uh, illegal abortion practices were going on, and I was very interested to know how come and why it was happening. One name kept coming up over and over again, no matter the country, well, in the countries where they exist, and it's Mary Stokes International. So everyone in the UK, if I'm speaking in America, most people don't know Mary Stokes International, have never heard of Mary Stokes, but I'm sure almost everybody, if not everybody here, knows of Mary Stokes. And because I was already living in the United Kingdom, I knew about Mary Stokes. I knew what work they do here. I knew, I knew already that they, that they perform about a good third of the abortions that happen in this country legally. But then what shocked me was that they were in African countries and they were killing uh, unborn babies in different countries in Africa. So many women spoke to me and people who had worked for Mary Stokes and people, you know, it was just the same complaint over and over again. And then one day I thought to myself, I think it would be better uh, to go beyond just consoling the women because it's not only that they were telling me that Marie Stokes was doing illegal abortions, many of them were suffering from illegal abortions that they had got from Marie Stokes. Um, so <clears throat> things were adding up and I thought to myself, it would just be much better to get a camera and uh, sit down with some of these women who are bold enough or courageous enough to sit down in front of a camera and get their testimony so that the world can hear what has happened to them. But it wasn't just that. I also wanted the world to understand that Marie Stopes International, no matter the reputation they have here, even though they get government funding and they are so respected uh, by, you know, by the UK government because they get so much money from the Department for International Development, which is the government agency here for aid, I wanted people to understand that this is a very dangerous organization. <coughs> and they are an organization that even to take it a step further, uh, I think, well, this is what I believe. And when you watch the documentary, you make up your own minds. But what I saw was Marie Stokes International abusing women in, in different countries, uh, going as far as human rights abuses and human rights violations. They were going into African countries. They were violating laws that were laid down by these countries. But I think on top of everything, they were being funded, or they are still being funded, by Western governments. So in a roundabout way, I think that it's an aggression towards those countries, because if two nations respect uh, one another, and you know it, they have this bilateral relationship, and they're supposed to respect one another, <laughs> if then they bring in a third party, or a third party is brought in, and the more powerful nation is using this third party to bring in something dangerous, something detrimental, something that is uh, uh, bad for the population, I think is an act of aggression. And mind you, at least I know all of you here are young except a few of us, but the United Kingdom is actually, as a backdrop, uh, the colonial master, or the former colonial master of, of uh, at least uh, 20 of the African countries, almost half of the entire continent, the UK colonized us. Uh, and then we gained independence in the 1960s. So why is it that they should come back to a position where they are in another way colonizing us through this one agency or through this one organization that is going out 
and doing their humanitarian work and they say they're helping women with contraception, with abortion, uh, and they are violating laws and they are abusing people and destroying things and destroying lives and are above all killing African babies. So I, I decided we should, we should get the videos, you know, done. And so at this point it still was not a documentary. We got it all together. Um, and I, I think it was back in 2017 when we, I realized that we had, we had enough information. We had a, 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 a picture, something that could be a bigger picture. And I wrote up something like that looked like a script uh, and tried to raise a little bit of money and, and made this documentary, which is now called Strings Attached. So it's very low budget, and I'll beg your pardon before anything, it's not an Oscar. Uh, <laughs> nominated should be, though. But <laughs> so, it, so do pardon me. This, is, this was what we could do with what we had at the time. Um, but it's just so you know how even the little that we have done, how effective so far it has been. So this documentary was all let's just say released uh, back in January of this year. So it hasn't been uh, long released online. It's, it's online for streaming. But even before it came out, uh, I got the opportunity to screen uh, at least a third of it, a third of it, because it was cut into several segments and we were able to show a third of it at the White House uh, for, some, uh, uh, so for some White House officials during a policy meeting on the Mexico City policy. Uh, so this was back of March of last year. Uh, the entire documentary has also been screened. It was actually premiered at the Canadian Parliament. Uh, and then following that, uh, we got another opportunity through Spock, thank you Spock, to screen it at the House of Commons, and that was back in October. And after the House of Commons, we got, I got another opportunity to screen it uh, at, at the Hofburg, which is the Imperial Palace, in Vienna at a private event uh, that was organized by an MP out in Austria. Uh, and after that, we uh, also got an opportunity to screen it um, at the Ugandan parliament, which was the first African parliament where it was screened. And following that screening at the Ugandan parliament, uh, there was such an outrage among the MPs that they decided uh, on that very day that we screened it, which was back in February, that they were going to uh, put a motion on the floor, on the parliament floor, against Mary Stopes. So already, I feel that the documentary is doing what it was made to do, you know, no matter how, how accidental it came to be. Um, so that I've screened it in all these places, and now I am screening it here. That's to show you how important you all are. You are just as important as the White House officials and the Canadian MPs and the Ugandan MPs and the British MPs because you are the young people of the United Kingdom and I'm hoping and praying that if the MPs at this point in time do not take action from the House of Commons to stop this organization and to stop the aggression and to stop this kind of abusive uh, program that they are doing in the name of family planning and reproductive rights and health uh, projects in African countries that have not even asked for it, that all of you here will one day be the ones in charge and maybe one day you will, you will take action against this kind of abusive uh, uh, programming. Even if it's not this organization, but if you are ever in a situation of power, and I believe that some of you will be someday, where you are going to take decisions, that you will please take decisions to end uh, the neocolonialism that has continued in Africa in the name of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Oh, by the way, it was also shown at the United Nations four days ago. So <laughs> I was thinking there's one more place, yes, so, and then here. So this is, this is just as important as any other place it's been shown. Uh, and I will uh, beg you to keep an open heart. And hopefully at the end of it, you will uh, get something out of it. But I think we're going to have a short Q&A as well afterwards if you have any pressing questions about it. So I present to you Strings Attached. Questions? Yeah? I don't know. Is there anybody? Is there another microphone? Oh, there's another one. Oh, okay. Um, thank you very much. That's a really interesting documentary to watch. Um, I was quite interested in the statistics about um, investing money in family planning as opposed to education. Um, where did that kind of first come from and who uh, drove that movement and 
why have people widely abandoned uh, female education in Africa? Yeah. All right. Should do you want to take all the questions, or should I be should I take it one as each one as it comes? Yes. Okay, good. So, um, it, it's wonderful that you noted that if you saw the, uh, the graph that we got from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they track all the aid. You could see it very clearly that nobody can say this is a conspiracy theory. Indeed, uh, the emphasis is going away from education and even other basic needs like water and sanitation, and they're putting more and more into what they call population programs, which really uh, gets, you know, which really captures all the money that is given to organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation, Marie Stokes International. So it's really hard uh, to pinpoint exactly when it happened, but the theory is this for a lot of people who follow these things and, you know, some of the kinds of people who will gather at the United Nations, sometimes we discuss exactly when did things change. Because I grew up in Africa, I grew up in Nigeria, and when I was growing up, back, you know, a hundred years ago or so, <laughs> we remember, oh, I remember personally um, how scholarships, British scholarships, were a big deal. You know, my dad would say, study hard, because then you can get the British Council to give you a good scholarship. So it was such an emphasis uh, by a lot of the uh, Western donors for the African kids to have education, to go higher, to get you know, meaningful education, it's not just to read and write, but for us to be able to get enough education to become teachers, lawyers, doctors, you know, to get professional quali proper uh, professional qualifications. Uh, but if we were to pinpoint when things started going wrong, I would say it was at the Cairo conference that happened back in 1994. In 1994, the um, UNFPA, United Nations, uh, United Nations Population Fund, which is really the arm of the United Nations or the agency of the UN that is very interested in population control, UNFPA had their uh, you know, major, major conference. I mean, they have this conference every year that a lot of us attend as well in a every April. But uh, once, I think once every 10 years or something, they have a mega one. So they went out to Cairo and they had the Cairo conference in 94. Um, and at the time, uh, everybody gathered in Cairo and it was there in Cairo for the first time, at least as far as I could trace, was the first place where it was announced at this, during the course of this conference that population programs, condoms, contraception, even access to safe abortion, as they would put it, should become humanitarian aid. So before then, there wasn't much evidence that anyone or any donor saw these things as, uh, as a type of humanitarian aid. It was completely separated from uh, humanitarian aid projects but at this Cairo conference, the uh, outcome document showed that uh, donors were being then encouraged to go to the developing world and provide these population programs in the same way that you provide food. The problem with that is that once you put it on the same level as everything else, then you would see how enthusiastic the donors would be to then choose because it's for them to choose exactly what programs they want to uh, choose a b or c do you want to do education projects in africa do you want to do food projects do you want to do water and sanitation do you want to do population and everybody constantly has been going to the population programs and then the population programs when you look at the um the graph has had such a gradient, it is the one thing that never goes down and they never caught on it from year to year. They have added on top of that since 1996, which was really the outcome of 1994 Cairo conference up to today. So no one skimps on it. Instead, they keep increasing. But education projects had a huge uh, hit during the uh, recession back in 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, there was a lot of uh, cut, uh, you know, countries in the West were cutting costs and saying to African countries, rightly so, they were saying, we have a recession. So the UK government didn't give as much money as they, they normally would back in 08, back in 09, and back in 2010. But the one thing the UK government did not cut was how much money they were putting into uh, these population programs. So I think that uh, we're still seeing uh, the effects of Cairo Conference up to today, uh, and it's really hard now to uh, 
to change the, the you know, the, the, the tenor uh, of, of conversations as far as these things are concerned. Thank you so much. It was fascinating, to be honest. Um, I wanted to know concerning what you just said. Uh, what do you think are the background motivations for those policies? Because I think I'm not the only one here to have grown up with this propaganda of African people having 12, 20 <laughs> children that are all dying okay. from, uh, from, from hunger and from thirst and that are completely distressed and have to be helped. Mm. And so, do you, it, well, from what I've seen, it definitely doesn't come from a genuine need, need to help women because mm. they actually harm women. Yeah. So, what do you think are behind is it for this demographic? Yeah. Um, okay. Policy. Yeah. Yes. So uh, this uh, again, there is no simple answer. But this is, again, my theory. <laughs> and a lot of this, I, I actually wrote about it in my book, Target Africa, that came out last year. So this is what we've seen over time, um, is that all of these projects, so family planning, uh, abortion, and even the huge push for condoms during the uh, HIV, the worst time of the HIV uh, uh, epidemic across the continent of Africa, is that these things have... Um, become a confluence point for, for donors and wealthy people and wealthy nations and when wealthy institutions and organizations. So there is the end result and there are different donors with different intentions and different attitudes uh, towards the African people, uh, but they all have the same end. So it is a confluence point. Where the people who are very much into the environmental, you know, environmentalism uh, think or believe that they should cut population in the world, and the first place to do that, of course, is the continent of Africa. Uh, so they are very much, uh, uh, how do I say, they are very much committed to the project from the point of view of their beliefs in environmentalism and the need to keep the populations down. Um, then there are also the people who are coming with a feminist approach to it. Those, like the ones that we uh, gave crashed their meeting at the UN a few days ago, the ones who believe that women will never be equal to men unless they have abortions. In fact, I almost fell out of my chair when the man who was giving the talk, the man who was giving the talk from Belgium said, men and women can never be equal unless women have abortion rights. And I'm thinking, I can't believe this, right? <laughs> you know, so there are those who come with that, with that uh, point of view. Uh, no matter what you do, no matter how well women are doing in any country in the world, unless they have their abortion rights unlimited, there's still a lot of complaints. And, and you know, you see that in, in the UK where female MPs who have had the best of everything are out there at the House of Commons still fighting like, you know, like someone is trying to stop them from something. So uh, they are coming with a feminist approach, with the environmentalism approach, with uh, those who have the, what I call the G.O.D. complex. And that's where the Gates Foundation comes in. Those who think that they should come in and save the Africans. And again, thank you for pointing out, it is a propaganda. The people who say that the Africans are having 10, 12 children, I can tell you that it is a propaganda. Yes, there are some African countries where uh, the birth rate, the birth rate is, is remarkably higher, like in Mali and Niger Republic. But also in those countries, you can't really do much about it because the people themselves have a very, um, how do you say, a high desire uh, for children. So their, their, their so-called desired fertility rate is also really, really high. So the only way you can stop them from having children is to force them from, you know, to, to stop having children. Uh, so when people desire to have children, let them have children. There are most parts of Africa, though, most parts of sub-Saharan African countries, believe it or not, uh, the fertility rate is falling. And you can see this. This is the data is out there. We are also having a reduced um, fertility rate from year on year, just like you are having. The only thing that is that I think is, um, that is pushing or propelling our donors so much is that the rate that the fertility rate is falling in most of the Western country is, you know, it's, it's, it's quite precipitous. It's really it's just falling so fast to the point where you are getting below a replacement rate. But Africa is having 
let, let's just say natural slope down, but we are, we are having a reduced uh, fertility rate. Everyone, well, my, my own parents had six children. Everyone, when I was growing up around me, were either six, seven, or eight. As you know, that, that was the normal size of family. And now in my generation, everyone I know, I mean, I know someone who has four kids, and that's it. And everyone thinks that they have a lot. My brother has four kids, and it's like, it's a lot. And my sisters all have three, everyone has three kids, or two right and our fertility rate is also reducing and again it's i find it quite concerning because especially among the educated africans they are westernizing and one of the first marks of westernizing or modernizing is to try to not have many kids so it's very posh among young africans um but uh, that's i think that's just it's a confluence uh, of issues and in the conflict where they, they all have the one end which is uh, coming to Africa, charge into Africa with this so-called sexual and reproductive health and rights, but everybody has a different intention, some kind of good, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, innocent, but some of them are actually uh, quite terrible. Uh, but the end result is always bad. It's always bad. Okay, just the last question, a quick question. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your pro-life work here. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, um, I know you have shown this documentary to like many big places and organizations. So, uh, which has been the response, like whether negative or positive, like on both sides, and which one has been like bigger? And uh, if you have found in your way, like more people like uh, finding about this information, supporting you, and like getting this movement to get to know like that this is happening and that's a hypocrite of Western sure. world to, sure. to found these population programs and rather than actual and education. Actual, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, like, which has been the response uh, from this documentary and this truth? Yeah, I've had the best response right here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, it, the response has been varied, but I'll, I'll just say, uh, fortunately, in most of the places, like at the different parliaments, the response has been quite positive. Um, a lot of people didn't honestly know, even some more liberal politicians um, type people, they say they don't know. When we, when we showed it in Canada, there were a few uh, liberal MPs who were there. They, they would say they didn't know. Um, I have shown parts of it or either shown parts of it or talked about it even at the USAID, the United States Agency for International Development. And there were people there who were from the previous administration. And they were, they felt, I, when I looked at them, I just felt they looked a little bit ashamed. Because sometimes they're sitting in the office and, and someone is throwing out these millions of dollars. All these people from Brussels, they're talking about, you know, 180 million and they're, they're smiling. They don't know what happens on ground. If they mean well, uh, then usually it's with this kind of response that we didn't know. Uh, but I think the best response so far and the most, uh, I'd say, the, and which is, which is really expected, was at the Ugandan parliament because the Ugandan MPs were ready to charge and they, were, they just kept saying, what are these people? I mean, is there any outsider here? <laughs> One of the Ugandan MPs actually called Maristops a terrorist organization. Okay, so that shocked me. So, but you know, it, it happened and it was shown on, uh, on the network news, the cable news that night in Uganda. Uh, it was the number one news item. So it really, it really resonated with them. And it, it should, because these people, I mean, there are two sides to this story. There are, the, there are the people on the Western side of the story, which is all of you, who didn't, probably didn't realize how deeply Marie Soaps uh, was working with their evil in other places with your money or your parents' money. You know, they, they're going out with taxpayer funds and going to Africa and doing these things. So there's the Western side. But I think the, the African side is also there. And they should be, I think, even more outraged because these people are coming among us and they are, they are wrecking havoc within our communities, especially among the poor people uh, and the most helpless ones. So what we would want to do in the near future is you see those women who couldn't speak English who were talking about their contraceptive experiences, uh, we would like to sue. I, I, want to see, I want to see some of them suing Pfizer and really getting out of poverty by the time we get them 50 million euros you know, in compensation. <laughs> but I, I, I honestly believe that these organizations should be sued to an inch of their lives 
Uh, but they know that the Africans never respond. And you know, in every case that I have gone through, I have never seen one successful case where anybody sued or got any compensation. Uh, the woman I talked about with a, with a newspaper article about the woman who eventually had a hysterectomy, uh, I found her MP while I went to Uganda. So this woman, I didn't know her before, but her MP fortunately was sitting there and said, she knows exactly what happened. She told me that Marie Soaps eventually paid her some money, which would be about 800 pounds. Uh, but I told her, I think I should come back with some lawyers and we should sue Marie Soaps for 800 million pounds. You know, <laughs> we, should, we should get them really paying for some of the horrible things and damages that they are causing. And even then, uh, you know, nothing will suffice other than them just being completely shut down. So the response is varied, but I'm hoping that we can get even a uh, better response by the time more people see this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.